I'm compelled to recall the mesmerizing lines by Guru Dev Rabindranath Tagore. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the word has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action. Into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. A very good evening to all the dignitaries and my fellow mates. I take immense pleasure in welcoming you all to the second talk in continuation of the on ongoing celebration of the Platinum Jubilee year of our institute and Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, marking 75 years of our independence. In proceeding of the program, I now owe the stage to Mr. Sabyasachi Mandal for the welcome address. Thank you. A very good evening to all those who have joined this program. On behalf of our director, Madam Dr. Bandana Prasad, the member of Lecture Organizing Committee, I, Sopasachi Mandal, welcome you all to the BSIP online lecture series in celebration of the Platinum Jubilee Year of our Institute Foundation and Ajadiki Amrit Mahatsa, making marking. 75 years of our independence. Owing to the current pandemic situation, all of us are bounded to follow the protocols and precautions measures everywhere, including our research activities. Consequently, this lecture series is also organized on a virtual platform. On this auspicious time, we take this opportunity to specially welcome our honorable speaker, for the second lecture in this series, an eminent academician, historian, and a professor at Harvard University, Dr. Urunab Ghos. Thank you, sir, for your presence and gracing of today's function. I also welcome all the respected guests, scientists, scholars, and all BSIP members of this function. Now I request Mr. Ms. Arshita Srivastava, research scholar, to take the seat and carry forward the rest of the program. Uh, now I request our director, ma'am, to say a few words. Ma'am, please. So good evening, everybody. And I welcome all of you for this function, for today's function. And I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Arunab Ghoshri agreed to deliver this lecture. And um, I remember that uh, when I joined this institute long back, and uh, with my seniors, I was, um, they used to tell us about stories about uh, Birbal Sani and then his, uh, his association with people from China and other places. So, but I'm very happy that today's lecture is very, very interesting, going to be very interesting. And uh, since uh, we have large number of uh, people, large number of scientists and students and then administration, many people now they are of uh, very young and last, they have joined this institute in the last 10 years. So it would be really nice that uh, we will get to know more about uh, that, uh, how that uh, that association was built and what was the, what, what type of work they were doing, what was their uh, thinking at that time. So I'm very happy and then I'm looking forward for your lecture. I'm very happy to thank you so much, Aruna uh, Goshi, that uh, you agreed to deliver this lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for your words. So now I believe our listeners must be eager to know about our today's speaker. So let me share this with you all that uh, his achievements till date are no less than a research paper for me to read. 
So, uh, Professor Arunab Ghosh, our esteemed guest today, is riding high as Associate <coughs> Professor at Harvard University. His research and teaching interests lie in social and economic history, history of science, transnational history, and China-India history. He graduated in history and in economics from Haverford College, and he did his master's, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia University. He is professionally well-versed in modern and classical Chinese. Almost four doctoral and many master's theses have been supervised by Professor Ghosh. As a visiting member, he has been part of various universities, especially in Shanghai and Singapore. His first book, Making It Count, Statistics and Statecraft in the Early People's Republic of China, investigates how the early PRC state built statistical capacity to know the nation through numbers. His work has appeared in the Journal of Asian Studies, Osiris, the International Journal of Asian Studies, PJHS Themes, East, and the PRC History Review. He has contributed in more than 10 public writings, like in Times of India, Indian Express, The Quint, Anand Bazar Patrika, and many more. His work has been supported by grants and fellowships from the Andrew F. Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Social Science Research Council, and Columbia University. He serves as a reviewer for Alexander von Humboldt Professorship, British Journal of History of Science, and many prominent journals. At present, he is working with Association for Asian Studies, American History Association, History of Science Society. So as we, we can see that he is on the crest of the wave. So with a lot of curiosity inside me and obviously the waiting audience, I would like to invite our today's speaker, Professor Arunab Ghosh, to deliver his talk on Professor Birbal Sani and Professor Su Sen connected histories of science across India and China. So before we begin the talk, there are two requests to the audience. Uh, kindly mute your mic during the talk and second is we are allowing question even during the talk so if anybody would like to ask question please raise your hand and we'll let you ask your question to the speaker you can also put your question in the chat box so that we can uh, take it after the talk uh, that's all thank you and now i request dr aranab Ghosh to take the mic please Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Srivastava, for that over over generous uh, welcome, uh, as well to Professor Vandana Prasad uh, for, for being so kind and inviting me. Um, and, and to everyone else who's in the audience, and to Dr. Mortakai for the original invitation. Um, it, it really is an honor <clears throat> to, be, uh, to be here to join you as you celebrate uh, such a momentous occasion in the history of the Institute, and of course, in the history of uh, the Republic of India. Uh, I'm personally also uh, especially delighted to be back at the Bidwal Sani Institute uh, because I have very fond memories of my uh, visit in, in 2016 uh, when uh, uh, Professor Vandana Prasad's predecessor, Professor Sanjay Bajpai, was the director, and he, along with Professor Mukund Sharma, uh, uh, were extremely generous with their time and the help they offered me to get uh, this research started. Uh, so I have very fond memories of those few days I spent at the Institute, but then also over at Lucknow University went to Tagore Library and other places, other uh, other places to collect materials. Um, so, and finally, of course, thank you to everyone who's joining us. I realize it's Friday evening, so people often have plans. It's the it's the start of the weekend. Uh, so, thank you, uh, thank you for uh, for being here. So, I'm going to uh, quickly share my uh, screen here. So, uh, I do have a bunch of slides to show. Oops, sorry, that is not what I wanted to do. Okay. Is the so now I can no longer see anyone, but uh, maybe someone can um, using their their mic. Just let me know if the screen is now if they can see the slide, the first the landing slide. Is it visible? Yeah. Are we in? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so what, what I want to do today is so I, I should also preface since uh, since uh, we can take questions as I speak. 
I can't see anyone, so I can't see hands raised. So if the moderator or anyone else can can you know sort of let me know or just interject if there's a question, that would be helpful because I can't see the uh, the audience members anymore. Sure, sir. Okay, great. So uh, what I want to tell you a little bit about today, my talk uh, is really uh, uh, is is based upon um, uh, a paper that was published earlier uh, this year in the International Journal of Asian Studies on Birbal Sani on his Chinese doctoral student, student Shuren, uh, and then through that an attempt to try and think about uh, the connected histories of science in China and India, and, and think about it, the place of Asia in the 20th century in, in many ways. Um, I sort of prefer prefatory remarks, I would add that this paper is part of an ongoing project um, that seeks to map other similar connections between Chinese and Indian scientists across the 20th century. Uh, and if there's interest later on in the q and I'm happy to you know, briefly mention some of the other cases that I've been collecting material on that I hope to sort of stitch together into a, a larger narrative and, uh, and a larger set of arguments. But the broader goal in doing something like this uh, is really to try and ask, can we can we offer new perspectives on the history of histories of China and India in the 20th century? And the reason for doing this is to some extent uh, uh, inspired by uh, a critique offered by a very famous uh, Indian historian of China, whose name is Prasenjit Duara, who said that too much of the uh, scholarship on China and India tends to fall into two buckets or two poles, two extremes. On the one hand, you have um, those people who do essentially long durée uh, cultural and intellectual history. So looking at sort of the transmission of Buddhism from uh, India to China over, you know, starting 2000 years ago and that process and, and, and a range of questions that are tied to that, including trade and so on. That's one sort of extreme. The other extreme, which is much more driven by contemporary concerns, is, is really uh, framed within a, a real politique framework, which is entirely about geopolitics and China and their relations, which the importance of which, of course, we can all appreciate given uh, the latest uh, events over the past couple of years in uh, you know along the along the china india border in, in the galvan valley and elsewhere um but what this what, what what happens though is that in in these two extremes uh, i think we lose out on a lot of other ways of thinking about uh, our history about the history of china and about the kinds of con insights that might emerge when we think when we explore the connections between them so the goal with this project in some ways is to think about histories of china histories of india histories of science um, and also histories of interation connections, as you might uh, call them, or histories of uh, ways that in the past people have thought about Asia itself. So as I go on, I'll try and broach some of these uh, these issues of methodology uh, and and sort of frameworks uh, in my in my remarks. But to but to really get us get us started, and for those of you who have who have seen the uh, uh, the, uh, the this published article, uh, this this image should be somewhat familiar. Uh, this is. Uh, a, a telegram that I discovered at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi, uh, which, as you can see, is a telegram from Birbal Sani. It is sent to Xu Zhen, Xu Ren, as, as the Chinese pronunciation would be, um, in uh, December, 20th of December, 1946. The date is, uh, I can put my pointer, you can see the date down here, 20th of December, 1946. Um, and it's just three words, hearty, Congratulations, Doctor. So, uh, you know, finding it, I was in the Nehru Memorial Archives already because I knew about this connection. I was searching for um, uh, sort of materials on Shuren within the the Sani papers. And again, for those of you who are interested in the history of the institute, uh, the Nehru Memorial uh, Museum and Library in Delhi has a, a very large collection of Bilbo Sani's papers. I think they run into. Uh, several thousand pages, actually. So, uh, at any point, uh, what if one, one is interested, that is the place to go to to understand uh, aspects of Big Bilbasani's life as well as uh, uh, the history of the institute in many ways. Um, so, what I want to do is use this uh, this this tele uh, this uh, this telegram as a, as a motivation to ask, well, what is this going on? What what is going on here? Why is Sani sending this uh, celebratory uh, uh, message to Shuren? And, uh, and sort of to understand the relationship a little bit further. Now, the way I got interested in this, or the way I discovered this connection, of course, is not this telegram. This telegram was in some ways affirmation of the fact that there was something very interesting to the story. But the, the, the way I got interested in, uh, in Shuren himself uh, was for a totally different means. A few years ago, I was um, in China. I was um, in, 
in the, uh, the Institute for the History of Natural Sciences, and I came across the oral history interview of, uh, uh, sorry, is that a question? No, okay. Uh, so, so I came across the, the oral history uh, interview of the, the Chinese botanist uh, Wu Zhengyi, which is the first name that you see here on the slide. Um, and uh, in, in this uh, uh, sort of long interview reflecting on, on his life as a botanist, his contribution to the development, development of botanical sciences in China, Wu Zhengyi uh, is amongst the most prominent botanists uh, of the 20th century in, in China. Um, he mentioned uh, that he had been a member of a delegation from the Chinese Academy of Sciences to New Delhi in 1951, so just shortly after the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Uh, and this delegation was the first Chinese delegation to visit a non-socialist bloc country. So if you look at this this time period in the, in the history of uh, both China and the history of the world, um, you know, you had already a Cold War beginning to take shape. So you had a, a sort of America-centric bloc, you had a Soviet Union-centric bloc, and then an emerging sort of non-aligned third bloc, if you will. But at this time, the, the Chinese were very closely aligned to the Soviet Union. So to go to a non-socialist bloc country such as India was a big deal, and he remembered it in those terms. But he said he was part of a delegation that went uh, to New Delhi, uh, and the, these are the other delegation members listed here, and, and the focus of this, uh, the symposium was uh, to study uh, the origin of, origin of crops, basically, and crop cultivation. Uh, so this is an image here uh, of, uh, of a reception being held at the, Indian, uh, the Chinese embassy in New Delhi. And as I list, ran through the list of the members of the delegation, of course, I did sort of basic biographical research who are these people. I discovered that one of these people was actually already in India and did not travel from China to attend the, the symposium, but actually traveled from Lucknow. And that person, of course, was Xu Ren, who is uh, identified here now in the contemporary transliteration of his name. So it's the same person, which uh, in his time would have been written as HSU, J-E-N, uh, but to, in, to, in today's sort of transliteration system, it's written as X-U, R-E-N. Uh, and on the photograph, it's this gentleman here, the second uh, from, the, from the left, uh, is Xu Ren. So, so I was like, well, what's going on here? How, what, is, what is a Chinese scientist doing in India in 1951? Uh, and that too in a field like botany or paleobotany, which is already an extremely specialized area of, of knowledge production. So I began looking at, well, let, let me try and understand who Xu Ren is. So very briefly, this is just to give you a biographical sketch. Um, um, Xu Ren uh, was born in 1910, and he was educated in uh, primarily in Beijing. Um, and then worked for a while um, in um, sort of southwestern China when, uh, the, when the war with Japan began in 1937. Probably thereafter, a lot of the institutions moved further southwest to places like uh, Yunnan in Yunnan province and the city of Kunming in particular. So he was there, but then his, his sort of the standard trajectory changes because in the mid 40s, in his, I guess, he's in his mid 30s at that time, he comes and spends two years at Lucknow University. Uh, and is a is a doctoral student, um, and that's you know you can now connect the um, the telegram which was dated December 1946, right? So that is basically the end of his stay in India, and he returns uh, uh, with a PhD, and then he spends a couple of years in India. But what was interesting was that it wasn't just his two years as a student that were important uh, as far as his India connection is concerned. He actually returned to India in 1948 and spent another four years in India. Now, as not no longer as a student, but as a professor at the Bidwal Sani Institute, which was of course not known as the Bidwal Sani Institute then, it was just known as the Institute of, uh, of uh, Paleobotany at that time. Uh, and then following his four-year stint at the, at the Institute, he returned to China and sort of had a very distinguished career, uh, first working for the Ministry of Geology, but then later on for the Chinese Academy of Sciences, where um, he was seminal in the, in the establishment of the Institute of Botany. Um, What's interesting is that uh, in producing the, his papers, in producing papers in the Nehru Memorial, you discover that Sani, uh, Xu and Sani actually had a very close and intimate relationship. Uh, and the letters that they exchanged, uh, you know, speak to, speak to sort of the, 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 it wasn't just a question of an advisor and a student, but a real close friendship uh, that had evolved. Um, I know this is probably redundant for 
uh, this audience, but I have a slide that very briefly sketches out uh, Bir Balsani's, the main dates in Bir Balsani's life. Um, and as you can see here, um, sort of uh, born in 1891, um, educated primarily uh, first in, in the Punjab University, Lahore and Punjab University, and later on at Cambridge University and the University of London. Uh, and then the important thing to, to, to recall in this is that he spent most of his professional life at Lucknow University uh, from about 1921 till 1949 when he died uh, prematurely. Uh, and What's, what's interesting is, is to, you know, how we think about uh, the, legacy, uh, the legacy that he, he left behind. And I want to suggest that there are at least three major areas in which we need to you know, take Birbal Sani's activity seriously. The first, which you know, is, should be obvious to any, any serious scientist, is, is the research that he did and the kinds of contributions he made. And of course, here I'm relying upon the various biographies that have been written about him, um, which list uh, major contributions in up to eight different areas uh, within the, the fields of botany and paleobotany. Um, and of course, research that spanned not just uh, India, but, but other parts of Asia as well. Uh, but in addition to his research, he's, I think, also extremely important uh, as an institution builder, especially as an institution builder at a very early stage uh, in the history of uh, the Indian Republic. In some ways, um, he was planning to, to set up the institute before independence, and he was in some ways waiting for Indian, Indian independence so that he could he could establish the institute uh, properly. So, uh, but but even before the institute, he was playing he played a huge role at Lucknow University in terms of in in trying to establish a, a, a foundation for science education in India. Um, and then the third area I think in which he has his legacy is hugely important. Of course, is in in training students, a whole generation of students that he trained. Uh, that then went on to uh, to run the institute in the early years, in the in the in the late 40s and early 1950s. Of course, what's interesting is that if you look at the memoirs, whether it's the you know the biographical memoirs of the uh, fellows of the Royal Society, because he was a fellow of the Royal Society, he had been elected in 1936. Uh, including, if you look at um, other biographies that have been published by him, by about him, uh, mo almost all of them don't don't uh, mention the fact that he had a Chinese. A doctoral student uh, and uh, don't don't sort of fully account for uh, the important role that this doctoral student actually played in the early years of the institute. So it wasn't just that he was a student, but that he actually made a significant contribution himself to uh, to uh, the institute uh, sort of uh, establishing itself. So before we proceed, I want to uh, uh, do a bit of an interlude. And, and talk about some larger issues, but but uh, also just to show on a map some of the places that I have briefly alluded to already and that are important to the story of, of sort of China-India scientific connections. So on the Indian side, you can see, uh, uh, you know, this is sort of further northwest of, of Lahore is uh, the village of Bhera, which is where uh, Birbal Sani's family hailed from. And then, of course, Lucknow, I pointed out, because Lucknow was where he spent most of his professional career in India, I also pointed out Calcutta because Calcutta in this time in particular, the 30s and the 1940s, was an extremely important uh, uh, sort of conduit or port of transfer for a lot of uh, scientists from China, Southeast Asia, who are traveling further west, whether to Europe or to the US. What they would often do is take a ship either from, say, Hong Kong or Singapore, come to Calcutta, and then they'd have to change ships you know, take a take some uh, ship going to, to London or maybe even to the US, excuse me. Uh, and in doing so, they would often have to break journey. It wasn't that you just get off. And it's not like, you know, today you even you're, 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 you're transferring at an airport where you have a two hour layover. Often uh, in these times, the lay layover could be a few days, but it could be at times as much as a few weeks or even a month. And so Calcutta became important because if you're spending a month and you're a scientist, then you what are you going to do? You're going to Try and see what are who you know who are the other scientists in the city who do work related to my my own areas of interest. So there are lots of interesting stories of Chinese physicists, um, Chinese um, um, a mathematician, and so on, trying to reach out and meet colleagues in Calcutta. And in some instances, they had enough time to even travel further into the country. And in one instance, actually, and I'll, I'll mention him briefly. Uh, one of Shuren's mentors, uh, who was a friend uh, of Birbal Sani's, visited Birbal Sani in I think 1940. Six, uh, he took the train up to Lucknow to visit him, and he was he was in India because he was breaking journey. So, so these are some sites that are important in India. Similarly, just to point out, uh, you know, uh, the site in the middle here, Anhui, is where Shuren is from. 
he did most of his uh, education in, in Beijing. He taught in uh, Kunming for, for several years. Uh, and then after his stint in, in, in Lucknow, he returned to Beijing and spent most of his, the rest of his life here. And I pointed out Hong Kong because Hong Kong is likely where he transitioned, he transited through en route to, to India. Uh, so as I said, I want to take a brief interlude, maybe spend like five, seven minutes to talk a little bit about um, sort of how, how sort of the, the different ways in which we think about India today, uh, it, sorry, the, the different ways we think about China and India today. Um, and as I understand it, I can see sort of three broad sets of reasons or three broad ways in which this thinking proceeds. Um, so the first one has to do almost entirely with, uh, with contemporary developments. So this, you know, you can frame this as the rise of China and India in, in the world today, politically, economically, and so on. Uh, and you can divide this up in those terms, uh, you know, sort of to look at sort of uh, basic metrics. This is just a representation of, you know, how China and India compare demographically to other countries in the world. And you can see how large they both loom. India is actually, I think, slated to become even larger than China in, in the next few years, uh, as China's population uh, growth actually uh, has significantly slowed over the past um, about two decades. Um, but tied to sort of this sort of demographic reality, the demographic centrality of China and India is, is the economic centrality also. And this is data from 2017, 2018 in BBB terms, uh, which basically shows China and India as um, two of the three largest economies in the world today, uh, sandwiching uh, the United States. Um, so you sort of have, have a sense that there is, there is a, a, a tremendous amount of momentum just generated by the actions that India and China undertake uh, that then makes them very important to global economics, global politics, and so on. Um, <clears throat> some of this, of course, also combines um, in, uh, in what is perhaps the largest challenge confronting mankind today, uh, which is uh, climate change and, and environmental degradation. And here, uh, I think the, the, the demographic and the economic reality combine, and people talk about both China and India as planetary powers. And what they mean by that, of course, is that their activities are large enough now to influence global environmental patterns, global climate patterns. So it's not just what India and China do within their boundaries that stays within the boundaries. They actually have a, a global impact in some ways. And this is largely, as you can imagine, a, a declensionist narrative, sort of a narrative of, of, of decline. You know, look at urban pollution, look at resource exhaustion, look at greenhouse gas emissions, fossil fuel use. Um, pretty much across all of these metrics, the story looks pretty bleak. There is, of course, a, a flip side to this. Both China and India, China in particular, but India also to a great extent, has invested heavily in um, researching all kinds of renewable en energy, so from wind to solar to, to hydro and, and, and a range of others. And you have these interesting kinds of data that emerges. This is just an example of NASA, uh, a NASA uh, image that shows how much India and China are contributing to making things greener. Of course, this itself has a nice twist to it because this is not greening because of reforestation. This is greening because of uh, increased crop area under crop cover. So, so that itself has its own contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not always a straightforward story. Um, one final comment on the contemporary comparison. I think it's important to remember that even though we can think of China and India in comparative terms, China really is fast outpacing India and has been for about 20 years now. So, uh, so increasingly, the, uh, the contributions are going to be skewed much more in favor of, uh, of China. But I want to transition to the second, uh, sort of the second reason why China and India are interesting to look at and, and are so on everyone's minds in some ways. Um, and this has to do with the fact that uh, the concern with China and India today is very evocative of an earlier moment uh, when there was a similar kind of excitement uh, about tracking what these two countries are doing. And that moment was actually the 1950s, um, when both again seemed to be evenly poised. India had become independent in 1947, uh, a republic in 1950. Uh, the People's Republic of China was established in 1949. Uh, and there was sort of a broad sense of anticipation um, that, uh, that, that followed people, uh, that, that people uh, interested in these two countries uh, had. Um, and to, to sort of motivate uh, you know what some of the thinking to, to give you a sense of what some of the thinking was like. Here is um, a quote from Frank Mores, who was uh, in the 1950s the uh, editor of the Times of India. Uh, and in the but what's interesting about him is that he had served 
as a reporter for the Times of India in the 1940s in China. And then in the early 50s, uh, in, uh, now as, an, as the editor of the Times of India, he had been part of a delegation that had visited China. Uh, and then he subsequently wrote a book, which is uh, titled, as you can see from the bottom of the slide, Report on Mao's China, where he uh, sort of had this sort of summary to offer, where he said, by a quirk of fate, Asia's two most densely populated countries, which are also neighbors, are the testing grounds for two differing and contending political philosophies. If China proves that a system of government ensures economic security to the vast mass of her people without detracting greatly from their sense of freedom, Asia will be lost to communism. If China, on the other hand, sorry, if India, on the other hand, demonstrates that democratic government can ensure not only economic security, but individual liberty, then Asia will be won to democracy. What India and China are today doing is wrestling for the political soul of Asia. So you can see already the way in which the stakes are being uh, being sort of identified, but also in the ways in which this is, is evocative of our contemporary moment and sort of thinking about systems of governance, thinking about um, issues of individual freedom, of, uh, of, of liberty, and, and, and so on, and of course, economic growth. Uh, but Frank Morris was not alone. There were a whole range of interlocutors who were really quite interested in, uh, in how the Indian experiment and how the Chinese experiment will unfold. Uh, so here, for instance, you have uh, a quote from Wilfred Mallenbaum, uh, the, the, the first quote uh, on the slide, who was um, a, an economist who was at MIT, where, where there was a, uh, something known as the, the India Project, uh, which was essentially an attempt to understand uh, what is going on in India and, uh, and, and to sort of see what the implications of, that, of India's developments might be, and by extension, developments in China might be, uh, to what happens in other countries uh, that are outside of either the US or the Soviet ambit uh, during the Cold War. So Malandov says, countries, especially in Africa and Asia, will be influenced in their own programs by what seems to be happening in these two lands. However much India and China disavow a state of competition between alternate, alternative paths for the transform transformation to growth, comparisons will be made everywhere and lessons put into practice. Um, and you know, if you had sort of this kind of dispassionate attempt to understand how things are going, you also had very partisan kinds of voices. So here I would just add put two names here. So, uh, PMS Blackett might be might be a name familiar to, to people in the audience, a very famous Nobel laureate in physics, but also politically quite active. Um, he and along with John Robinson, a very famous Cambridge economist, they said were definitely in the China camp. They thought that China's prospects in the 50s were significantly better. They didn't really think uh, India could much of a chance given the kind of internal diversity uh, and the other challenges that it faced. But then you had pro-Indian voices also, and amongst the most pro, uh, uh, prominent was J.B.S. Haldane, another very famous uh, uh, biologist, a British biologist, who said that it is India that really offers uh, a true model for the world going forward. And this is a quote that I've pulled, uh, thanks to Ram Goha's work. Uh, I also happen to be proud of being a citizen of India, which is a lot more diverse than Europe, let alone the USA, the USSR of China, and thus a better model for a possible world organization. So you sort of see, I'm trying to suggest to you sort of, this is the, the, the Shuren and, and Birbal Sani exchanges are happening when this is the larger sort of way in which people are thinking about what's going on in China and India. There's both excitement, but not just both, there's excitement, there's anticipation, but there's also a fair amount of judgment, people saying what is likely to happen, what is unlikely to happen, and so on. So these are two reasons. Very quickly, I want to signal to you a third sort of reason of framing that is really important for us to acknowledge and that, this has a slightly longer history, uh, and it has to do with the ways in which China and India both figure in a lot of, in the, in the Western imagination, going back to the Enlightenment itself, so going back to the 16th, 17th century itself. And here what we see is that China and India really served as the, the, you know, the perfect thing to compare what was going on in Europe with, sort of the, if you will, the other, or the basis for comparison. And you see this across a, 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 whole, a whole range of very important uh, European thinkers. I just pulled a few quotes here that you can see. Uh, you know, you have uh, uh, people like Hegel, people like Marx, people like Max Weber. They all, in their own ways, were trying to understand what was essentially the amazing amount of growth and the amazing sort of kinds of developments that were taking place in Europe, starting in the 17th century, um, and trying to explain it by using China and India as the, the sort of um, if you will, a control group in some ways so for, for comparison by saying that it's China and India that are static, unchanging, and have all these kinds of problems, and it's the West that is dynamic. 
So you have sort of um, a, a whole sort of way of thinking that emerges out of this. And this in many ways continues to underlie uh, or, or continues to inform a range of social science disciplines. So whether you look at sociology, anthropology, even history to a large extent, that are informed by this um, this kind of comparison and the framing of China and India as uh, as backwards, without without ideas of progress, without even ideas of history, and so on. So, recent scholarship uh, on China and India, on history of the non-West, in many ways has tried to grapple with these kinds of problems. And I want to signal to you, if anyone is interested, really some of the really some of the interesting works that have emerged in the past five six years on different aspects of China and India. And I won't go through them here. But what I want to suggest to you is that they're grappling with different kinds of methodological problems of how do you compare, how do you evaluate the importance of, say, connections that you discover, of ideas circulating, of materials circulating across sort of present day national borders. Because present day national borders are, are, are a fairly new uh, and recent, recent thing. Uh, so how do you then account for that? And this is just a, a way to sort of summarize some of these methodological stakes where how do you do comparisons? Is, is doing comparisons, is the best way to do a comparison really to be, to do what, you know, this whole tradition of, um, of, of Western social science has done, uh, starting with Hegel, for instance, which is to sort of identify China or India as backward and then explain Western superiority? Or do you try and understand difference without automatically assuming one side is better than the other? So this is sort of this idea of reciprocal comparison that, um, some historians, uh, Roy Bin Wong and Kenneth Pomeranz, for instance, have put forward. And then, then there's work by, by people like Tan Sen Sen and others who have focused on connections and realizing that the contemporary national boundaries don't really help us understand the kinds of connections and circulations that existed between what we think of as China and India. So in some ways, the burden uh, for this, uh, you know, sort of slight detour is, is to sort of suggest to you that what are, what are we trying to do? And what we're trying to do here is really to try and see if we can use uh, the experiences in one place uh, to understand another, right? So understand one place through the experience of another, uh, but also to really then revisit existing paradigms and completely rethink them, uh, whether it's this idea of a static India, static China that is, that is very old or something, uh, something else in many ways. Um, and um, what I think is, this is this is significant because I think it has particular salience for histories of science, and this is where I want to come back to the thinking about science, uh, and in particular histories of science in in, in Asia, and particularly in China and India. Uh, and as you can imagine, it, I think we all have this sense from 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 schooling itself about sort of how important science was um, as in the, in the nation building discourse. Um, I've just pulled two quotes to give you a sense of this. The first is from Nehru. Uh, actually, uh, uh, part of the speech he delivered at the foundation stone laying ceremony of the Bilbalsani Institute uh, on the 3rd of April, 1949. So this is just a week, I think, before uh, Bilbalsani passed away because of a heart attack. Uh, and then the second, where you can see, if you, I won't, I won't read each of them out. You can read them uh, yourself uh, privately, um, but you can see uh, the, the way in which science is being mobilized towards nation building, both by by Nehru, but also by Mao Zedong in the in the quote in, in the bottom half. So you sort of see um, um, uh, science as being central to the to the envisioning of a particular kind of modern industrial future in both countries. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that there is actually very little work, though, on whether comparing uh, what this meant, trying to offer a comparison to see whether well, how each experience helps us understand the other, or actually exploring connections between uh, these two projects to engage science in in major nation building. Uh, what we have instead are essentially uh, histories of science which are really dominated by um, Western science and the idea that this is a very old idea now. There's an article by George Basala um, who in 1967 who basically proposed an idea of a diffusion model of the ways in which science uh, operates where he identified uh, the locus of scientific innovation, scientific research really being in the West and other places, including China and India, as sites where there were second order kinds of changes, so second order so adoption, adaptation, and so on, but no real innovation. Um, so, so you have this sort of problem. And of course, a lot of recent scholarship has pushed back against this and said that is a completely uh, incorrect way to think about scientific activity and scientific research. Um, but what it has led to is a relatively siloed nature where a lot of the scholarship pushing back has been 
looking at science in, in the West and its connections to India or Indian science and, 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 and Western science or Indian, uh, Chinese science and Western science. And very little is then looking at Chinese science and Indian science in some ways. And that's what ends up what brings us back to Bivosani and, and Shuren and to, to the larger project that I'm trying to now uh, pursue. So I have this map again, just to give you a sense of the places that we very briefly talked about, uh, but also to suggest to you uh, a sense of the space that we're dealing with here, and in particular, what lies between these uh, these points, right? So what is the, the region that lies in between? Uh, and uh, and suggest to you that it's actually this, it wasn't just what today's term, Today's context would be very much the border and and demarcation and who you know who is this India is this China what is the status of Tibet and so on, uh, but but what what Bhimal Sani and Shuren were motivated by was actually a completely different set of questions, but very much about the same land, the same territory that is between these uh, these, these different cities that I've identified. Um, but before before I give you a sense of that, uh, or I can I, I, I guess I can plant that. It, a lot, of, a lot of this has to do with, I think, their contributions to debates about the theories of, of continental drift uh, and the ways in which paleobotany was absolutely central to some of this research. But I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I want to give you a quick sense of how, how is it, though, that someone like Shuren, a student in China, at a time when China has been invaded by Japan, the world, Second World War is raging, how is it that he ends up studying under an Indian scientist at Lucknow? Well, it should not surprise you, given how uh, prolific a scientist, how prominent a scientist um, uh, Birbal Sani was, that he had uh, a range of connections, global connections, not just with scientists in, in, in England and America, but also with, of course, scientists in China. And in my in my research, I've discovered that he was in he met with Chinese scientists as early as 1930 uh, in uh, at various sort of international conferences, and he was in correspondence with many of them in the years that followed. And this is just to give you one example of uh, how eager he was to maintain that correspondence in light of you know wartime problems and so on. This is the letter that he's written in 1938, where he's trying to basically reconnect with a whole range of scientists in China that he considers both colleagues and in some instances um, uh, friends. You know, maybe not you know close personal friends, but friends in a professional way. Uh, so he lists uh, a, a whole range of people here, and the person that. Uh, for our story is, is particularly significant is the second name here, Professor C. Y. Chang, who was himself a botanist and had been the teacher of, of Xu Ren. C. Y. Chang and Sani had known each other since the early 1930s, I think since 1930 itself, when C. Y. Chang had attended um, a, a lecture delivered by Sani uh, in Cambridge and then written to Sani afterwards, basically you know, saying how, how impressed he was, and then, you know, then began basically a scientific exchange about things, uh, things that were of mutual interest. Um, and it is C.Y. Chang who then uh, introduces um, Xu Ren to Birbal Sani and says, Birbal Sani would be a fantastic person to study paleobotany under. Uh, and in the early 1930s, um, Xu, Xu hadn't specialized in paleobotany, he had been trained in botany. This was sort of a way to think about how can we have someone in China who has experience in this, you know, emerging or relatively new field still at that time. So uh, that's at least, that explains in some ways how Chu became aware of Sami and how there was an interest for him to go and study in India. But of course, as you can imagine, uh, even in the best of times, and for those of you who, who have tried to do international collaborations today, uh, working with the Indian state is not, <laughs> is not particularly easy. Uh, and then you have uh, a Chinese state that can also be quite, quite difficult to work with. So what follows then is actually a long series of, of, of negotiations where Sahani is actively trying to raise uh, either money or uh, other kinds of resources so that Shuren can come and study. They approach the, the government in China also. Uh, Shuren approaches the government in China also. Uh, but then there's a tremendous amount of back and forth. Uh, and here's just one example to give you a sense of how, how much of this kind of legwork was needed. Uh, so this is a, a letter that Sani writes on the left-hand side to, to Pannalal, who was an advisor to the government of Lucknow at that time, uh, essentially saying, well, one, on the one hand, it's, it's such an honor that, uh, you know, this is the second cent line here, you can see it here. I'm indeed proud that a scholar of China um, has expressed a, a desire to come and work in my laboratory. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, he's saying, well, we need to, we need to raise funds for him. Um, and there are other attempts made. There was at this time a very interesting 
a fellowship program between that allowed for Chinese scientists to come and spend time in India. This is the late 30s, early 40s. But unfortunately, Shuren is not successful in secure, securing this fellowship because, again, as you know, with funding, a lot of these things are, in some instances, pre-decided. They already have uh, a certain set of people in mind. So, so Shuren was not successful uh, in pursuing this. But Sani himself was successful in securing funds, many of them from Lucknow University itself. And here you can see this is from the, the Lucknow University minutes of 1946-47, where, as my pointer is, is showing you in the middle of the page, you can see fellowship granted to Professor uh, uh, Chiren in 1945 has been ex extended until uh, 1946. So you see sort of a lot of these, these efforts eventually bore, bore fruit. And, and Shuren was able to, as I suggested in an earlier slide, come and spend time in India. And he's in, in India as a student from 1944 to 1946, uh, during which time he travels frequently with Birbal Sani to, uh, to uh, places like Masuri. This is a photograph from Masuri, actually, from a, a, a later year. Uh, but, uh, but he travels. Sorry? I'm sorry, I thought that was a question. I'll, I'll proceed. Um, so, um, and uh, he, he travels and, and conducts these long six week, eight week treks through the foothills of the Himalayas, all the way from, uh, you know, starting with in, 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 in sort of UP in the Terai and then going all the way up to, to essentially Jammu and Kashmir, collecting samples uh, of various kinds of uh, paleobotanic uh, specimens. Uh, after his PhD, Sami, uh, sorry, Shu returns to to China, and he spends a couple of years there. Uh, but uh, but it's very clear that both he and Birbal Sani are keen for him to return to uh, to Lucknow. And this is precisely when Birbal Sani has uh, is is in the midst of setting up an institute dedicated to the study of paleobotany. The first, as you all know, this is the first institute of such of this kind anywhere in the world. Um, and he's very keen that that uh, Shu join him and and. Um, and sort of help him uh, establish this institute. Um, and as part of that, uh, you, you, I have here, uh, you can see a letter here that uh, he writes to Xu uh, in uh, February of 1947. And what I want to direct your attention to is the underlying part at the bottom of the letter here, where he says, there will always be a place for you here, uh, and then offers him essentially a job with uh, a pretty good income at this point. Uh, and as, entices him to come. Uh, of course, as I said, Chu was also quite interested to, to come back to India because the uh, ci a civil war was raging in China at this time. So it was, a, it was not a very good time. It was not a very safe time to be in China. But also, it was a very bad time in terms of research, especially research that involved field work, collecting samples and specimens out in the field, and so on. So he had actually written earlier to Sani. I don't have uh, an image of that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just read out a quote from that letter where he says, for my part, I'll be very happy and willing to come to India again. I need more training, and I wish to stay in India for some time. If China is still in civil war, I would like to settle in India. So you see sort of this kind of real uh, real desire and real interest to be back in India. And as, I, as the previous slide indicated, he does actually make it back uh, and is present then uh, when the institute is established and becomes one of the first, prof I think maybe the first full professor besides Sani at the institute. Now, of course, we know that uh, uh, Sani dies prematurely and tragically within a week of the foundation stone being, a, being uh, within, within a week of the foundation stone ceremony. But what's interesting is that this doesn't uh, sever uh, Sani uh, Shu's ties to the institute. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, Birbal Sani's widow, uh, Mrs. Savitri Sani, and some of the other people involved insist that Shu and stay on. And, and continue to help them. And this is why he stays from 1948 to 1952. And here's just sort of to give you a sense of some of the, um, the kinds of activities he participates in uh, once uh, who, at the Institute. He, he's made a curator of the museum. So the, the, the museum that I'm, I had the, uh, the pleasure of, of, of visiting when I was there in 2016. But he's the original curator who sort of starts pulling materials together and specimens together. Uh, he. He's also heavily involved uh, in um, uh, sort of publishing widely. Uh, he conducts uh, 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 several treks uh, in Kashmir, uh, uh, 
such as one that I found evidence of for in August 1951. He helped set up the journal uh, The Paleobotanist, which uh, is, uh, is, of course, still still being published. Um, he also takes on uh, a, a, an advisorial role as far as students are concerned. And, and uh, from what I can tell, his first doctoral student was M.N. Bose, who then went on to a very illustrious career himself and was the director of the institute, I think, in the, from 1980 to 1985. Um, but it's not just the, the kinds of domestic activities uh, that are important as far as uh, Shuren's contributions to the Institute go. He also represents the Institute in these early years abroad. So he travels um, in 1950 uh, to, the, uh, to various international conferences in Europe, in particular in Sweden and England. And he, so a Chinese scientist, is representing an Indian Institute, which I think is quite a remarkable thing to consider. Uh, um, uh, if, if, let alone then, if not now, in some ways. Um, and and he, he spends a lot of time doing re, uh, speaking about his research on Devonian spores, uh, for instance. So uh, in, in, the, in the final few minutes, what I want to do is give you a sense of what it is that intellectually brought Sani and, and Shu together um, to try and sort of understand um, uh, why, you know, beyond just the fact that this is an interesting set of connections, there's so much more that's going on here that is worth worth our attention from a history of science perspective and from a history of China and India perspective. Uh, and to, to give you a sense of what they were really interested in, here's a couple of letters written by each. So the letter from on the left is a letter from Shu Ren to, to Sani um, uh, in his own hand, where he's basically telling him about the samples that he has collected in, in Yunnan that he's leaving behind at the Institute. And I discovered these letters, uh, letters after my visit to the Institute. If, if it had been before, I would have loved to see if we could have located them in the museum, if they're still there. Uh, I would presume they are. Uh, and then the letter on the right indicates, in some ways, um, uh, sort of um, uh, Sani also sending samples and specimens uh, to, um, uh, to Shuren. And what, what the, the samples that were of most interest with, those that were collected along in Yunnan, in Tibet, and then in parts of northern India and UP and, and, and Kashmir, and really had to do with uh, this question of what was still at that time, I think, a, a really unresolved debate from what I can, you know, what my own research has told me, uh, which had to do with uh, theories of continental drift. Uh, today, we would call it theories of plate tectonics, which are not the same thing, but plate tectonics sort of uh, it emerges out of these earlier debates in, in theories of continental drift. And as, you know, again, to this audience, I'm, I don't need to belabor the point, but it really had to do with trying to explain why is it that the Earth's crust looks the way it does uh, today. Uh, and uh, the work that Sani had been doing since the 1930s had had some connections to this. In particular, uh, the work he had done, this is just one example of a paper he published in 35 on the relations of Indian Gondwana flora with those of, of, of Siberia and, and China. And of course, a lot of this work had to do with uh, a type of seed fern known as Glossopteris. Again, in this audience, I, you know, all of you are experts. I'm not. I've, I've, I've just read about this. Um, but essentially, his work on, on, on Glossopteris and finding sort of regional variations that sort of seem to indicate that uh, the, the Indian subcontinent had, had a sort of dis a distinct geological history compared to, to other parts, compared to Southeast Asia and so on. And this really got uh, uh, accentuated by the discovery of another type of fern uh, called Gigantopteris, right? So the idea was that Glossopteris grows in very different climatic conditions historically than Gigantopteris. So if, if they're found close to each other, that then sets up a puzzle because how can two kinds of plants with very different kinds of climatic conditions coexist, which would suggest that perhaps they actually did not coexist and were quite far apart. Um, so this is, this, this is work that he had done, and this is work that I think Shuren, part of Shuren's work, involved this and this is what brought them together intellectually to say that wow we can actually uh, try and understand the impact of the himalayas on uh, sort of uh, or how did the himalayas come about and what was the impact of the creation of those mountains to uh, uh, sort of um, uh, the flora and fauna north and south and through that research it sort of begin to realize that that the the himalayas themselves were created and therefore the indian subcontinent was not a part of the asian landmass as it were. So I'm, I'm sort of summarizing very briefly, but this is this is sort of the, 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 a real sort of point of common interest that came through. And the second quote here that you see is from Sahani's assessment of Churen's uh, PhD thesis, where he says that in, in so it, it, the PhD thesis comprised five uh, five chapters, and it's the fifth chapter where he describes a collection of plants. Churen describes a collection of plants 
belonging to Gigantopterus flora in Yunnan, along, among which five new species have been recognized. Geographically, as well as in its composition, the flora serves as a link between the typical Gigantopterus flora of China and Korea on the one side, and that of Sumatra on the other. And of course, here he's pointing to the distinctions then that exist between this kind of flora and uh, the Glossopteris uh, that he has worked upon, and that is much more easily found south of the Himalayas in some ways. And this is uh, this this question remained an important uh, sort of theme in Shuren's work later in his career also. So here you can see a couple of examples. Uh, I've cited two of his papers from much later, from 76 and 78, where he's still working on this sort of this distinction and looking at Glossopteris and Gigantopteris. Uh, and trying to sort of understand where these specimens have been found along the Himalayas and essentially arguing for um, a, a particular, you know, essentially arguing for uh, what was then called continental drift, which, as I understand it, had, had, had certain, the, the theory was found to be not, not ideal, but now what we think of as, as, as plate uh, tectonics. Uh, so again, I won't, I won't read these quotes out, but you can see them in the interest of time, I won't read them out, but you can see them um, as, uh, as sort of continuing that intellectual interest and intellectual tradition uh, into these questions uh, forward several decades. Um, and in some ways, this is this is sort of um, um, what I want to suggest to you, that the, the kinds of questions that they were in interested in engage with exactly the same area that is right now uh, a, a major source of contention or has been a major source of contention between China and India, and in some ways was a major source of contention even on the British were in control of India uh, with uh, with the Tibetan government earlier, and then with the with the Qing Empire in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so, uh, but what they're doing here is thinking about the same region in a very very different way, with a very different time scale in mind. Because now we're talking about geological time and not the time scale of nation states and individual human lives, and that allows us to re reconceptualize what this space is and how this space has come about, and to try and understand it. And this is an example from the 1950s, but I, I want to conclude by saying that there are other kinds of research that are continuing today that, again, hearken to the possibilities of these kinds of connections and to sort of a shared set of intellectual concerns um, that, that, that are very much present, but that we tend not to identify, we tend not to think more seriously about. Um, and here are just two examples of that that uh, you may or may not have heard of. The first image is of, as you can read, is of the, the Himalayan Chandra telescope, uh, which is established uh, uh, on the Indian side, uh, is an Indian telescope. Uh, and uh, this is, again, essentially to, 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 to carry out uh, interstellar uh, research. Uh, and the Chinese have been establishing telescopes on their side of this border also. But what's interesting is that there's actually a tremendous amount of collaboration taking place. So it's not that these have been established in competition with each other, but they've actually been established in collaboration because the ideas, the scientific ideas that are, or the questions that are motivating people on both sides are really the same. So you see evidence not just of actual communication and collaboration, but you're also seeing jointly published papers um, and you know new kinds of projects that are being conceived of together, sharing of data and, and so on and so forth. So that's that's one one contemporary example of something that I think Sani and Shu kind of approach and a legacy that Sani and Shu embody. Uh, the second example is these are two posters, uh, one from uh, from India, the other from from China, which basically speaks to again a common uh, sort of scientific pursuit, which is the conservation of the snow leopard. And the snow leopard, as you uh, may know, its its natural habitat makes a mockery of uh, the China-India border and the line of actual control and all of these things because the snow leopard goes back and forth across these very high Himalayan peaks. And of course, it is an extremely endangered animal. So both Chinese and Indian scientists have been working together in conservation, in the conservation sciences, to try and figure out ways in which we can conserve uh, a, a megafauna like the snow leopard. This is, again, ongoing work. And if, again, people are interested, there's, there's very good scholarship on the second case. Um, I think I have the link in the in the bottom here for each of them, uh, so I can, I'm happy to share them. The, the, the example of the, the, the telescopes and the, the, the sort of interstellar research, that is still not a part of any kind of scholarship. It is uh, it was a, an essay in the New Yorker. Uh, but anyway, so I, I want to sort of conclude with this note that, that I think what Sani and Shu were doing at that time were really setting up uh, a way of, of, of doing science and pursuing science and focusing on a set of questions that are in some ways timeless and quite different from the ways in which I think contemporary geopolitics would have us divide things. 
Uh, and that I think is hugely important because it also then helps us reconceptualize what we mean by spaces like Asia, what we mean by uh, something like Himalayas and how we might understand them. So I'll, I'll stop there because I think I've spoken for too long. I was hoping to speak for about 10 minutes less. So I apologize for taking too much time, uh, but I look forward to any questions or any comments that people might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, actually, those uh, telegram you shared, those letters, uh, those all gave us uh, goosebumps. Like, uh, in those tough times also, how uh, Professor Babel Sani and the people from China managed to uh, continue their contact and they never wanted to lose their contact because of the uh, country issues. Means, uh, that's like... Uh, that's great to uh, see all those letters and uh, telegrams. Uh, so uh, anybody from the audience uh, would like to interact with the speaker or any uh, curiosities, uh, if anyone? So I, I should, maybe I can add a quick uh, remark to your, uh, to your very gracious comment. Um, there are actually, um, so for those interested, these are all part of the Bibel Sani papers uh, at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in Delhi. And anyone can go uh, and, 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 you know, go and, and look at them. And you can, uh, I, I only looked at a very small sampling of, of his letters. And, and what's interesting about this generation and this time is, so this is, you know, forget email and, 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 and WhatsApp and Twitter. This is the time, it's not even the time of facts and, and anything else. These are people writing often by hand or in old typewriters. So this is a time of, where letter writing is, is really important and letter writing is still an art. Today, I think we, we, write, we don't write letters, we write tweets effectively, whether they're on WhatsApp or whatever else. But so there are these beautiful long red letters you can read by Sani, but also people writing to Sani that evoke a very different time and a very different way of communicating and a way of thinking about research and scientific questions uh, through the medium of, of letters. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so now I would like to invite uh, Dr. P. Murtikai to deliver the vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, before I propose what of thanks, I have one question, very quick question. Like, sure. uh, uh, is there any uh, motivation to organize a pan Asianistic view uh, in collaborating between Dilwar Sani and then Suren? Yeah, this is this is a great question, and and I didn't uh, touch upon this in in much detail in my remarks today, but it's certainly a, something I discussed in that paper that I that I published earlier earlier in the year. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Pan-Nationism has a very interesting history going back to the late 19th, early 20th century. And essentially, it was it was devised as a, as a response to, to some extent, Western imperialism and an attempt to create a certain kind of Asian solidarity as a response. It emerges as an idea uh, in, in Japan. Certain Japanese uh, intellectuals are hugely influential. But then it's picked up by a range of intellectuals all over Asia. So. One of the people who's particularly excited by these possibilities is Rabindranath Tagore, who you know was cited. We 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 heard um, his famous poem at the start of our session today, um, and and because he was explicitly against this whole idea of nation states, he saw nation states as being really a problematic way to organize the world. So he found these ideas very powerful to think about Asian Asian connections, Asian solidarities, Asian identities, and so on. Uh, but there are people in in, in other parts uh, in in China also. Sun Yat-sen, sort of the, fa the the father of the, of the both the the PR People's Republic of China and of the Republic of China and Taiwan, he was deeply influenced by these ideas also. So you have a tremendous amount of interest in thinking about, about what, what is possible if we disregard these nation state or other kinds of identity based uh, markers and think about a nation identity and, and the possibilities of collaboration, the possibilities of development, mutual growth, and so on. Of course, um, there's two important things to, 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 to note here. One is that um, this, a lot of this energy remains in the realm of intellectual and cultural exchange. So thinking about philosophy, thinking about culture, and we have very little sense of this in other areas, and in, in, including in science. And in, that, in the paper, I try and make the case that what Birbal Sani and Shuren are doing in some ways is articulating their own vision 
of Pan-Asianism. But it's a vision of Pan-Asianism that, emer that emerges out of practice, that emerges out of a set of intellectual questions, a set of scientific questions that suddenly reconceptualize how, how does, why does Asia look the way it does is, is sort of the result of some of the, the, the kinds of questions they're interested in. Uh, so it's a very different way of thinking about the history of Pan-Asianism as an idea and as a practice in some ways. So I think these kinds of insights are valuable and they can add to this longer history of Pan-Asianism. Just one other quick footnote. Uh, the, other the other sort of thing about the history of Pan-Asianism is by the 1930s, it becomes a very problematic term because that's when the Japanese empire begins to, not only is it very powerful, it begins to expand and, and sort of conquer various parts of China and Southeast Asia. Uh, and then they start using Pan-Asianism as essentially an imperial project, a project to say that we will lead Asia into this new future and we'll, we'll create a new Pan-Asian identity, but with Japan on top. So that it, it becomes political and militarized and so on. And that's when a lot of uh, intellectuals in many parts of the world become much more worried about this. Um, but the idea has, has, has later, uh, uh, later iterations. And, and one of the most prominent ones that I mentioned very briefly in the paper also is the Asian Relations Conference that took place in 1947, before India became independent, actually. So it was in March or April of 1947 that you have the Asian Relations Conference held in Delhi, where members from all over, uh, members of the Asian countries all come together to basically discuss what should the future of Asia be and what should inter-Asian relations be. So there are modes through which the idea of Asia remains important, and which is why I think this kind of research also is important to, to unearth the different ways in which people are thinking about Asia. So, so thanks for that question. Again, I spoke for too long. No, no, thank, thank you. That's good. <laughs> uh, it's nice to uh, hear our own history, actually, being in the institute, <laughs> where you study research, and we are hearing. Thank you. Thanks right. very much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now we come to an end of the lively gathering. And I have a very pleasant duty to propose a vote of thanks on the successful completion of today's lecture. On behalf of our director, the organizing committee, and the audience, I personally thank the speaker of the day, Professor Arunab Ghosh, for accepting our request and agreeing to spare his valuable time to deliver a historical piece of information about Professor Sani and his relations with China. Being a part of the youngest generation of BSF scientists, many of us are still unaware of the relationship Professor Birbat Sani maintained with his contemporaries, colleagues and students across the globe. It was very informative and memorable talk. Thank you so much, Professor Arunab, uh, once again. I also thank all the audience for being with us all this time. It is an honor for us that you opt to be here instead of doing something else. Uh, so before we end up, I want to inform you that next talk in the series will be announced soon. Uh, that will be in the November, month of November. So with wishes for your health, the good health once again, I thank you all for your presence. Have a wonderful evening and fantastic weekend. See you all in the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.